One of the stranger strategies that the United States took in our long war in Vietnam was to wage war on the land itself. By the tens of millions of gallons, we sprayed herbicide on the land to defoliate the jungle, to deprive the guerrilla fighters of cover, to kill crops, to try to drive the Vietnamese people into the cities. It's the kind of policy, frankly, that militaries think of when they think they're God, when they think they have accounted for all the possible consequences of their actions. The United States had not accounted for all the, po all the consequences of that action, of their massive use of Agent Orange and other herbicides in Vietnam. We did not even admit to many of those consequences for 40 years, until October 2009, when a new president and his new combat-wounded Vietnam veteran Secretary of Veterans Affairs announced that Agent Orange-related illnesses in U.S. service members would presume to be related to your time in the service if you served in Vietnam. Then five months later, VA Secretary Eric Shinseki announced further that illnesses associated with Gulf War illness from the first war in Iraq would also presume to be related to your time in the service if you served in that war. The idea was to recognize the fact that Americans who served in those wars got hurt in those wars in ways that had previously been dismissed as not related to their time at the front. To get those folks the care and the disability benefits that they earned, those two decisions brought hundreds of thousands of new claims for disability benefits into the Veterans Administration. Now, at the same time that was happening, under this new president, the U.S. was also starting to wind down one of the longest wars in our history, the Iraq War. Another war in which some of the signature injuries, in this case traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress, those injuries can be less straightforward to diagnose and relate to your service than, say, a bullet wound would be. The same president is now winding down the longest war in our history, which was fought simultaneously with the Iraq War, with many of the same signature injuries. Not one percent of our population that has been fighting both of those wars for more than 10 years will all be coming home and transitioning from soldiering to being veterans. The story of how the backlog at the VA piled up so badly in terms of veterans having to make, wait months or even years on their claims. That story about how it all piled up is not hard to understand. But no one saw this coming. When the Agent Orange claims were added, and the Gulf War illness claims were added, and other classification groups were added, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan ground on for years and then finally started to end, anybody could see that all of those things would have paperwork consequences in the form of more disability claims at the VA. But the management of the paperwork has not kept pace with the changes that caused the increase in the paperwork. The VA's own numbers show that the wait time for veterans is not getting better, it's getting worse. In 2009, it was 161 days. The next year, 165 days. The next year, 188 days. By last year, it was 262 days. The universe of the problem they are dealing with is getting bigger by design, by policy, by good policy, by their own policy. But the pace at which they are dealing with the existing problem is not getting better, it is getting worse. And we keep hearing from the VA, we got this. Really, for a decade now, we've been hearing that it's all under control. We need to bring the, that, that backlog of claims down. VA has made significant improvements to the claims decision-making process, but clearly more must be done. We will improve the timeliness and accuracy of claims processing. We are implementing a robust plan to fix the, the problem. We have a fix for this. Uh, we're open for business and we will uh, end the backlog in 2015. That last remark from our current Secretary of Veterans Affairs, General Eric Shinseki, who for these past few years has not much talked to the national press. Maybe that interview on CNN this past weekend shows that that is changing. But I, for one, am delighted to be allowed to talk to anyone from the VA, which has been next to impossible for us as a show, as we have covered this issue for years now. The agency would not give us anybody to talk to about this until tonight. Joining us tonight for the interview is Tommy Sowers. He's Assistant Secretary for Public and Intergovernmental Affairs at the VA. Prior to being nominated to that position by the President and confirmed by the Senate, Dr. Sowers was a major in the U.S. Army Special Forces. He served two tours in the war in Iraq. Uh, Tommy, it is really, really nice to see you, and I say that not out of politeness. I really am glad that you're here. Thanks. It, it's great to be here, and, and I do want to just thank you for your focus on this issue. I know you're the daughter of a veteran, and I appreciate your uh, focus on the issues we care about. I, I don't want to look a gift house, horse in the mouth because I finally got you here. Sure. Um, but why has the VA kept such a low profile and explained so little 
of what's going on, particularly to a national audience, as the country has become increasingly worried about this problem? Well, it, it's a great question. And uh, look, the President and Secretary Shinseki have made a historic commitment to our veterans. And I'll give you a perfect example. Over the last few weeks, there's been a lot of talk about the backlog of disability compensation claims. And what we're finding in are there are a number of veterans that simply just don't know that if they're an Iraq and Afghanistan veteran, that they have five years of cost-free health care. I'm one of those patients. And not only do they have it, they've taken it. Uh, this generation of vets has utilized VA health care at 56%. That's much higher than any generation of vets. We've got to do a better job of getting out there and educating about what these claims are and about what our takedown is. And I think you're seeing uh, some of that this week. Let's say there is a member of the military who just got back from Afghanistan. He's leaving the military next week. He's becoming a veteran. Uh, he believes he has PTSD or maybe he's been diagnosed with PTSD in the military health care system. He's going to file a disability claim with your agency. So that's not for, uh, I need an appointment to get care. That is, I can't work because of my PTSD, and I need to be paid disability benefits to compensate for the fact that I cannot work. What, what will the process be like for that veteran right now? What should that veteran expect right now in terms of time, timing for the paperwork? Well, well, first off, again, when it comes to the actual treatment, there's, there's, there's immediate assistance out there. So we've got a veterans crisis line, 1-800-273-TALK, and over 700,000 veterans, active duty service members, and their families have called uh, this number. Um, they can walk into any of our 1,300 points of care. Here in New York, there's five vet centers, and this is for uh, veterans, their families, to help with readjustment. So I want to make sure that that's clear, is that they can get the help that they need. Now, when it comes to filing the disability claims, they can go online and file it electronically. They can go with a veteran service organization who will help them walk through that claim. But the challenge is right now, we're still receiving about 97% of our claims like this, these big stacks of paper. And as long as we're receiving this paper, it's going to be a challenge in order to keep up with it. I don't know the last time you looked up something in an encyclopedia, but it's been a long time since we did that. But that's what we've got at a lot of these claims offices. The great news is, is that this is the, the key year of action. This is the year that we're transitioning from this paper-based system into an electronic system. And right now, uh, we've got about 56 offices, about uh, 25 of them have transitioned to this, and we're seeing a marked decrease in the amount of time it takes to process a claim. And it's just simple. Imagine looking up and trying to find a key piece of evidence in this versus just typing in back post-traumatic stress into a web-based uh, service. And that's the difference that's happening this right, year. Right now, any veteran who's filing for disability claims tonight or tomorrow, are they filing electronically or are some places still filing paper? Uh, the vast majority are still filing in paper. And that's the challenge. And, and you, you know, on some of your previous segments, you've asked, VA, what help do you need? Yeah. And it is a great question. We, uh, our budgets have increased. This president and secretary have fought for that, and they've fought for uh, increasing conditions. You mentioned that. Thank you for doing that in, in the uh, intro. But what we need is to partner with both the veterans and the veteran service organizations to make sure they know about fully developed claims, which is 95% of the claims that we get, we get a few pieces of paper, and then they say, VA, go and find the rest of the evidence, private medical records, DOD records. Only about 5% are filed with all the paperwork that we need. It's like getting your taxes with everything that you need to get them, getting, uh, them filed. We need to increase that number dramatically. And then we've got about a million servicemen and women that are going to be getting out of the military in the next four years. Uh, they're going to come back. A lot of them will go to school. Um, the education on uh, what the post-9-11 GI Bill means is, is very high, but a lot of folks don't understand the disability claims process. So we need those first sergeants, those junior officers that are out there that are going to sit with that private, that specialist, and say, what are you going to do next? Part of that conversation needs to be this is how you file your disability claim. The frustrating thing, though, is that the, the level of complexity that needs to be filed with the VA is determined by the VA. And so if people are turning in stuff that isn't cogent in terms of what you need to be able to file the claim, and that's nine, true 97% of the time, mm -hmm. that doesn't imply there's a problem with 97% of the people applying. That implies there's a problem with what you're asking of people. If only 3% of people are doing it right, then you're asking for something that's not doable. So isn't part of the process that you guys are asking for something that's unreasonable? Well, we just, we just came online in terms of the ability to file a claim electronically. And so if, if there's someone out there wondering about this, they can look up e-benefits 
or a fully developed claim. And those are the two methods that says, if you're going to file your claim, this is how you give us all the information that we need to, to rate it and uh, judge it as quickly as possible. In 2010, as recently as 2010, the Undersecretary uh, of the VA for, for Benefits, for the VBA, um, told the Senate Veterans Committee that the, 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 back of the, bra uh, the back of the backlog was being broken. And that was three years ago, and things have gotten worse since then. General Shinseki insists, and, and General Hickey insist, that um, this is going to be done by 2015. And I feel like my increasing urgency with covering this so much is that I have stopped believing them mm -hmm. because I am not seeing progress toward anything that looks like it's going to be better next year, let alone the year after. And I realize the transition to electronic records feels like it's going to work for you guys. Mm -hmm. But if it's not working on the ground in big pilot programs that we can see that veterans are saying, yeah, this is working for me, it's really hard to believe it's moving. Why, why shouldn't there be some kind of presidential commission or some external force sort of brought in to ride herd of the VA to make sure it happens. Well, when I came into this position, I've been here about seven months, I heard all about the backlog. And I filed a claim. I've gone through the, the process. It took about six months, which is the, about the historical average over the last 10 years. So I wanted to see it. So I went to one of these offices. And this was back in September, the first office that I saw. You saw piles like this yeah. all over. And you featured some of these in this cumbersome process. And I saw the electronic system there. And it looked sort of like Windows 3.1. <laughs> um, but then I went to Winston-Salem in January, the same office that you've profiled, the same office that was you know, sagging because of the weight of these claims. Right. The claims have, have not just been moved, they've been scanned. Uh, we've moved very quickly into this web-based online service. So I invite you to come see it. Come see, uh, this is the key year of transition of old offices that are still dealing with a 19th century system and new offices that deal with the 21st century. I will take you up on that, provided you let me ask questions of anybody that I want to without a minder. Done. I would make that agreement right. with anybody in a foreign country. I'll make that agreement with you. <laughs> Done. All right, it's a deal. Great. Tommy Sowers, thank, thank you. you so much. You have a very hard job, and I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back.